Hello and welcome back to Real Analysis. And as always, first I want to thank all the nice people that support this channel on Steady or PayPal. Now in today's part 47, we will talk about the proof of Taylor's theorem. Therefore, please recall, in a short way, we can write Taylor's theorem in the following way. If the function f is n plus 1 times differentiable, we can write it as the sum of the Taylor polynomial plus a remainder term. There, the Taylor polynomial needs the function and the first n derivatives of the function at the point x0. And the remainder term rn needs the derivative of order n plus 1 at the point xc, where xc lies between x0 and x0 plus h. Okay, so this is Taylor's theorem in a nutshell, and now we want to prove it. In fact, the proof will need some ideas, but in the end it will not be hard to understand. The first thing we will need here is an auxiliary function we can call capital F. It will be related to the Taylor polynomial, therefore I put the variable n into the index. Indeed, we also put h into the index because we want to choose another variable name for the function capital F. And to keep it simple, let's choose t as this name. Okay, now here you see it starts exactly like the Taylor polynomial, but now instead of x0 as the expansion point, we choose t. And moreover, instead of h, we now choose h plus x0 minus t. Now, this whole thing is the definition of this auxiliary function capital F. And please note, we can put in any number t that makes sense. For example, we can choose t to be x0 and then we get the original Taylor polynomial. This is not hard to see at all, because here we have x0 as the expansion point then, and this x0 will cancel. Indeed, this is one reason why this function will help us in the proof here. And the second reason you see when we put in x0 plus h. In this case you should see that this whole expression here will get us to 0. This means that in the whole sum here, only the constant term remains. Because in the case k is equal to 0, this factor here is simply defined to be 1. Hence, only the constant term remains, so in this case, f of x0 plus h. Okay, with this we have two important properties of our function capital F. Of course, at this point you should ask why this is a good definition for the whole proof. However, the best justification here is that simply in the end it will work. But don't forget, in the proof we want to find such an intermediate point C. And maybe you remember that the mean value theorem will get us such an intermediate point. Indeed, we try to apply the generalized mean value theorem. And there we simply need two functions, and the first one will be this capital F. Therefore, now we can also define the second one, and let's call it g. There we call the variable t as well, and we also put n and h into the index. Okay, now this function should help us with the remainder term, therefore we need the power n plus 1. Okay, and then, maybe it's not so clear at all, but we put h plus x0 minus t inside. Well, because we have the two functions, we now can apply the generalized mean value theorem. And this one will give us the intermediate point C. For this, please recall that the generalized mean value theorem translates differences in a quotient to a quotient of derivatives. This means that on the right hand side we have the derivatives of capital F and G. And they are evaluated at some intermediate point C. Now, because we already know where we want the C to lie, we now know what the difference is. More concretely, this means in the numerator we have f at the position x0 plus h minus f at the position x0. And then of course, by the generalized mean value theorem, we have the same for the function g in the denominator. Okay, at this point you should see why this helps us for the proof of Taylor's theorem. Namely, because here in the numerator, we have the Taylor polynomial and also the function f at the position x0 plus h. 
In other words, if we bring the denominator here to the other side, we should find the remainder term here on the right hand side. And of course, this is exactly what we want to do now. So our goal is to calculate this difference here. And as I already told you, it's the denominator times the quotient with the derivatives. Now, everything where g is involved is of course not so hard at all. Maybe let's start with the first term where we put x0 plus h into g. There you see, we subtract the same thing, so the whole term vanishes and we get 0. And in the second term here, we simply subtract x0, so h remains. So we get h to the power n plus 1. Okay, there you see, the first part here is simple, and now we only have to calculate the derivatives of the two functions. Let's start with the easy one, so we calculate the derivative of g. So we put that on the top and we write g prime. This is simply a polynomial, so this power comes to the front, and here we have one minus sign for the inner derivative. So we have minus n plus 1 times h plus x0 minus t to the power n. Okay, and then the only thing we have to change here for this is that we write x instead of t. And this means here we get h to the power n plus 1 times f prime of x. And then we divide this by the term from above. Please note here we have to put in x instead of t and we have cancelled both minus signs that are involved here. Okay, at the moment it does not look like the remainder term in the Taylor formula, but of course we first need to calculate this derivative here. We need a little bit of space for that, so let's do it below. So we want f prime of t, which is the derivative of this sum here. And the important thing you should see here is that we have to use the product tool here. Indeed, this will be the trick that makes everything simpler here. Okay, here in the first step, we take the derivative of the first factor and don't change the second one. This is not so hard, instead of the kth derivative, we now have the k plus 1th derivative of f here. Then in the next step, the product rule tells us we have plus and the whole thing the other way around. Which means we don't change this factor here, but take the first derivative of this factor. And there we can immediately conclude that for this, the sum should start with 1, because the first term will vanish, because k is equal to 0 is a constant, so the derivative is just 0. Hence, what we get is the kth derivative in the first factor, and in the second factor we have minus k times this 1 to the power k minus 1. And as before, this minus sign here is the inner derivative. Maybe that's the first thing we can do, let's pull that out and put it in front of the sum. And then in the next step we can cancel 1k here in the k factorial. This means now we have k minus 1 factorial in the denominator. And then you should see this fits nicely to the first term here. Because for example when we put k is equal to 0 into the first term, this is exactly the same thing when we put k is equal to 1 into the second term. Therefore, they will just cancel out here. And of course, this whole procedure continues for all numbers k until we reach k is equal to n here. Because there is no n plus 1 for the second term here. Therefore, only one term remains. And this means this whole derivative here is very simple. It's the derivative of f with order n plus 1 divided by n factorial times this factor to the power n. Now the last thing we have to do is to write x instead of t. And then you see we have our final result here. It looks more complicated than it really is because we can cancel this factor here. And then you see the last thing we have to do is to put n plus 1 into the factorial here. And then we get exactly the remainder term we wanted from the beginning. So please recall, this is exactly our rn of h. Okay, and there you see, this is the whole proof. It seems like a trick, but the whole idea was that we can use the generalized mean value theorem. And in order to apply it, 
we have to use the best functions that do the trick. To find them, maybe we have to do some trial and error and to put some ideas in. And then maybe at the end, we would get the functions f and g and they will work. Okay, and then with this, we have proven Taylor's theorem. Then in the next video, we can continue with real analysis. Therefore, I hope I see you there and have a nice day. Bye.